This is week 14, um, all about prayer. This series is how to pray, what to pray, why to pray, what prayer looks like. And as we navigate today's session, um, I want us to know that, yes, there are 11 specific passages of Scripture that I'm going to give you uh, that have really, really shaped and influenced my prayer life for the better. And I would love for these 11 Scriptures to just dramatically improve your prayer life as well. But before we get to those, um, there are a few things I want to say up front, which is um, when we talk about praying the scriptures, um, there are a number of ways that people understand that idea. There are certain things that come to mind for you when I say, hey, we need to learn how to pray according to God's word. We need to learn how to pray the scriptures and let the word of God guide um, our communication with God and that relationship we have with him. The word of God should frame that up and guide us in that. And there are certain ideas and images that come to mind for every one of us that might be different. And so to start with, um, prayer is, if I were to define prayer as I've been defining it for the last 13 sessions, prayer is talking to God with intention and with purpose um, as his beloved child and according to his word. Prayer is talking to God with intention and with purpose as his beloved child, and according to his word. Uh, The power of prayer is that God has determined prayer to be the method of causing certain things in our life and in our world. In other words, there's a lot of things God will do regardless of who prays for it to happen. There are other things that God has ordained sovereignly. These things will only happen should my people pray and ask for them. Okay, so prayer becomes uh, the method by which things happen, by which... Things uh, are caused uh, to happen in our world by the sovereign grace of God. Um, so we could say it like this, you know, there's a lot of things happening, that, that, that there's a lot of things that are not happening in our life and in our world simply because people aren't, aren't praying um, or because people don't know how to pray for those things or don't have the right motives. Just like James says, uh, you don't have because you ask with wrong intentions, with wrong motives. Um which is the idea that, yeah, you can pray for even good things that God might want to do, but it's not the right time or it's not the right way, and, and you have the wrong heart when you're praying for those things. So the whole, I, I understand that a lot of us are coming into this message going, I know how to pray the scriptures. I've been doing it for years, and yet there's still so much for us to learn. You know, there are three specific things I want to touch on when it comes to praying the word of God. Number one, we can learn from good examples of prayer in the Bible, okay? Number two, and I'll get into that, I promise. Number two, we can learn from clear statements or clear instructions about prayer in the Bible. So there's not only good examples, but there's good, clear instruction. There's good, clear statements, um, good, clear guiding, um, uh, yeah, scriptures that tell us what to do and how to pray. And then number three, there's this element of learning how to pray the scriptures directly, in a like, quotation, like we see in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus um, will quote the scriptures, stand on the word of God when he talks to, um, uh, sorry, I was just checking my message, my wife texted me, when uh, Jesus is talking to the enemy in the wilderness, um, he's quoting the scriptures verbatim, and so when we pray the scriptures, there's so much power in that, um, that I have slowly, uh, slowly, come to learn like, wow, there's so much power in just praying the scriptures. So let me take you to Psalm 145 verse 18 to show you what I mean. Psalm 145 verse 18, it says, the Lord is near to all who call on him, um, to all who call on him in truth, in truth. Um, So there is a sense in which this right here is the key phrase. We need to call upon the Lord. Another way, way to say that would be we need to pray and communicate with God and Uh, worship him in truth. This is what John chapter 4 is all about. Jesus meeting the woman at the well. She's going, you know, are we supposed to pray on this mountain or your mountain? We don't know where to pray or where to worship. It's pretty confusing. You guys say it's supposed to be in Jerusalem and, 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 you know, in those specific, that region. And and we as Samaritans, where is it? And Jesus goes, well, uh, the time is coming when it won't be on this mountain or that mountain. It'll actually be that all who worship um, God must worship him in spirit, in truth, which is to say it won't matter where you are. Um, so that's the beauty of following Jesus in spirit and truth is that his word guides us, not just on how to live, but on how to function, on how to pray. Um, this idea of calling on God in truth is 
for a lot of people, foreign because of the fact that we just glean our prayer uh, methodology from people, whether it's pastors or preachers or um, YouTubers or our parents. That we, we, we are the con- conglomeration of people that we respect, their, their prayer times and their methodology. Our prayer time becomes the, almost like a conglomeration of all of that. And I'm not saying that nothing that we glean from people is good, um, but I just want to make sure that that doesn't become the ultimate guiding force in how we pray and what we pray. The Word of God has to, um, that we call upon Him in truth. And if I've learned something from someone or inherited something from my parents or watched a pastor demonstrate a way of relating with God and praying that actually isn't according to truth and it's not proper, then I got to ditch that and let the Word of God remain supreme in my life. Okay, so as we navigate this, the, the three main things we're addressing before we get to the 11 passages that have shaped my prayer life for the better forever um, is that we need to learn from good examples like Daniel, like Joseph, like, we're not Joseph, he's like the one person we, doesn't, we don't see praying. Um, Daniel, David, Elijah, um, these great, you know, men and women of God that know how to talk with God. These good examples that are set for us in the scriptures, that's number one. And then we need to learn from the clear statements made in scripture about prayer. And number three, there are direct quotations that we can begin to pray. And I think when we get to that, it'll be maybe possibly, um, it won't be like what you and I have been taught when, it, when we're told to pray the scriptures. I'm sorry, my mind's all over the place this morning. Um, but I just want to set the foundation um, is when we get to that, it might not sound like what you and I have been taught, which is almost treat the word of God like a magic spell book, a book of incantations. Just say the right words in the right way and you'll get the right results. That's not necessarily what I mean. Okay, but when I say learn from good examples, let me show you some good examples. These are some of my favorite prayers uh, from people in scripture. We could have done this. We could have done an entire like 10 week series on just the prayers of the saints um, and how people prayed in the Old and New Testament and what that looked like and glean wisdom from that. But I don't want to overload you. This is just more of, we're going to summarize that idea. Daniel, uh, in chapter 2 of Daniel, he prays with his three friends um, that God would reveal the mystery of of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And uh, verse 19 says, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And then this is how Daniel responds to God revealing um, the vision what King Nebuchadnezzar was really dreaming. Daniel answered and he said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. And I just want you to be thinking about how Daniel's praying here. He seems to shift from like God gives to you give, to talking directly to God. There's this sense in which he'll stop and just worship God in a general sense in the middle of his prayer. He changes times and seasons. And then he'll shift back and begin talking to God personally. And it's just interesting. Uh, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to start over, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. So just thinking about how Daniel's praying this in response to the vision God gave him should 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 affect the way that I pray. There's there's some aspect of Daniel's prayer time. I, I don't want you guys to begin looking at the prayers of of the saints as like this 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 perfect blueprint for now I just need to copy that and paste it in my own prayer time. This is just look at the way Daniel approaches God. Look at the way Daniel speaks to God. Um, just the way he worships and 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 begins to proclaim what God does and and who God is and what God's capable of, you know, he gives wisdom to the wise. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. And to you, look at how it shifts. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and I give praise, for you've given me wisdom and might. And you've now made known to me what we asked of you. So Daniel's acknowledging the fact that God answered my prayer. And before he even gets to the fact that, God, you answered my prayer, he just declares who God is and what God does. And I think that is a large part of of learning from the prayers of those who have gone before us, is to notice how a lot of their prayers are framed up with worship and praise first. And then they get into, you know, it's Thanksgiving, it's worship, it's praise, and then they get into other things. But just learn from this. You can actually just, and I didn't know this until like I really started pursuing God for myself. But when you talk to God, you can actually just declare who he is. 
And it's not weird. It's not like you're informing God. It's not like he didn't know and you're reminding him, that's right, I am awesome. It's that you are actually stirring up your own soul and heart by reminding yourself who he is and at the same time declaring those praises directly to him. Like this is the God who reveals deep and hidden things. Just to like go through the list of characteristics and attributes and works of God can really stir your heart up and your affection for God. You've given me wisdom and might. You've made known to us the king's matter. So that's a good example for for Daniel uh, to learn from. We can learn from the example of Daniel, uh, who seems to just go, man, this this God actually answered us. He heard us. He he worked wonders. He came through. And the only reason, you know, God did that is because He's capable of it. He's the one who gives wisdom to the wise. And and these this specific prayer of praise and adoration right here, it's directly correlating to what Daniel's facing. With King Nebuchadnezzar in charge, with King Nebuchadnezzar taken Jerusalem into exile, with Judah, you know, taken out of the land, all these different things spiraling around are affecting the way that Daniel chooses uh, to recall God. And so in those moments, just like a, a quick pause, when we learn from examples of people who pray in scripture, Sometimes it will be like you pray verbatim what they pray. Other times you're like, ooh, I like that. I like the way they address God as the one who changes times and seasons. I'm going to adopt that for myself. Or even in my own prayer prayer time today, I just want to be mindful of the fact that he's the God who sets up times and seasons. He's over time and space itself. He's over human history. And that should inform the way that I approach him and the way that I pray and the way that I communicate my requests to him. Now let me take you to David. David in Psalm 119 is just going off. This is David praying. He's not just declaring to like a congregation how good the word of God is. This is David's private prayer journal. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He says, I have sworn an oath and I've confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. And then look at verse 107. I'm severely afflicted. Give me life according to your word. So why is it that David is... uh, just celebrating the word of God because he knows that it's that very word that God gives life to David through. That is the way in which God extends life to David is through the word that David chooses to keep. That's why David can say, God, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Something to glean from this just in passing is how, how often do we just exalt God and praise him for how magnificent his word is? How often do we just pause in the middle of our prayer with God or just throughout our day And just like praise and magnify God for how awesome his word is. How often do we just, you know, um, celebrate the word of God and take time to think through what it is that his word does for us and, and how wonderful his word is in our life and for our family. How often do we do that? That just might be a good practice to adopt for us is to celebrate the word of God, not just who he is, not just Christ incarnate come into the world, the the eternal word emanating from the Father, but the the word of God that instructs and leads that we see in the scriptures that tells us how to live, how wonderful that is. David is not um, burdened by and uh, condemned by the the, the Torah. He's not, um, I don't know, feeling restricted and so legalistic. He's celebrating the instruction and wisdom found in what at that point he only knows as the Torah. He doesn't have the, um, the prophets. He doesn't have the writings. Um, those are in formation. Those have yet to happen. He doesn't have the New Testament. What he has at that point is Torah. And he's able to celebrate that. And at the same time, in the middle of his affliction, what does he cry out? Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. So that might be something that you and I can glean. Uh, from the example set by David. This verse tells us that we should ask God to lead us with his word. That should be a prayer in our hearts, at least, not daily. I'm not going to hold you to some restrictive rule and say, hey, if you're not praying this once a day, you're a fool. All I'm saying is, hey, throughout your life, whenever you see the need for guidance or life or direction, or you just sense this, I want to celebrate God for his word, do that. Pray that God would guide you according to his word and lead you and give you life according to his word. And I know that sounds elementary, but we can accumulate so much information that the basics of following God get buried underneath these more complex, beautifully mature ideas. And it's like, actually, we should go back to the simple basics at times and just remember, hey, God's word is delightful. Let's just honor him for that. Or hey, God actually wants to give you life and lead you into life through his word. Let's ask that he would do that. Let's learn from the example of David. Um, I could also take you to Psalm chapter 90, which for a lot of people is... 
Um, Psalm 91, rather, is going to be the go-to for a lot of people. A prayer of protection and refuge and, and safety and security. They're going to run to Psalm 91 and they're going to pray that verbatim. And even when we do pray the scriptures verbatim and we just quote the scriptures in our prayer time, there can almost be this autopilot mode we go into where we don't really think about what we're saying. I've memorized that scripture. I know it like the back of my hand. I could be in the middle of a fight, <laughs> just just go into town and be quoting that in the back of my mind. I have memorized, it's solidified in my heart. And we can almost, as we pray, quote the scriptures in an autopilot kind of, I'm not even aware of what I'm saying kind of way. And uh, Psalm chapter 90, verse 14. This is also what David says. This is another prayer of, rather Moses, sorry, not David. This is Moses. Um, Psalm 1, uh 90 verse 14, I'm all over the place. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. This is a beautiful prayer that is so, um, I think it's rightly attributed to Moses, thinking about what Moses asked for in Mount Sinai. God, would you show me your glory? Um, And Moses goes, satisfy us in the morning. Not just me. I love that it's a collective, communal, congregational prayer. Um, And that's also something we can glean from the scriptures is to pray congregationally. Have your quiet time, sit in the, you know, get in the closet, get alone, get your cup of tea, turn on the music, if you turn the lights down low, whatever you got to do just to get uh, just a, a better sense in God is present and I want to be focused on him. Have that time, but also don't neglect congregational prayer. And I'm saying that to me. I'm, I'm someone that can so easily justify neglecting congregational prayer and collective communal you know, prayer as a body because I have my quiet time and I don't need to go to the prayer service and I don't need to go to the prayer and worship gathering. I don't need to go to Sunday service today. I had my time and there's just a beautiful truth to having and a need to having both. Um, Satisfy us with your steadfast love. I wonder if that's something we pray, that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. That is such a simple prayer. And yet, if you actually begin to pray that throughout your day, I like, if I were you listening to this message, I would say, hey, I'm just going to grab onto one of these examples today, just today. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't feel like there's so much for me to grab onto. Just grab onto one of these prayers. And for some of you, it's going to be Psalm 90 verse 14. And your prayer today, moving forward every hour for every five minutes on the hour, you know, satisfy me or us, oh God, in the morning with your steadfast love. I want to be satisfied. Uh, Moses is crying out for satisfaction and contentment and fulfillment that is rooted in the love of God alone. And for us to pray that makes us mindful of the fact that my soul level satisfaction doesn't come from moving forward in work. It doesn't come from financial gain. It doesn't come from being acknowledged in a community. It doesn't come from seeing my gifting come to life and people applauding for me. It doesn't come from me experiencing the healing that I've been praying for. It doesn't come from everything falling into place in my life. Me being satisfied comes from knowing the love of God on a deeper level and knowing that I'm known by Him. And for us to remind ourselves throughout the day by praying that is to your advantage. So for some of you, you're, what you're going to take away from this message is I'm all day just going to pray Psalm 90 verse 14. God, satisfy me, my family, my, satisfy us as a body with your steadfast love. We want to rejoice and be glad in you all of our days. And there's something about doing that kind of thing throughout your day and, and taking the necessary measures to to put that discipline in place that will really, really take your relationship with God to another level, uh, that will really keep you so mindful, um, so aware of just how much He loves you. We can also go to Luke 22, Jesus. Here we have both the prayer of Jesus being answered and the prayer of Jesus not being answered. And you, what do you mean? Well, He says, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. The Father is not willing, and he doesn't remove the cup. But the second half, and the main overarching prayer of Jesus' heart, is, I just want your will to be done, not mine, yours. And the Father does that. Listen, this is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. In his moment, uh, in his greatest moment of pressure and turmoil and potential and opportunity to just give in and walk away, all of that, his, his, he's alone in this, and his three best friends have fallen asleep over and over. They're not aware. They're not on the same page. They're not there. Um, and so there's this feeling of somewhat physical 
uh, isolation and loneliness from the rest of humanity, almost to be set apart, and and, and this this overwhelming um, pressure that Jesus is feeling. And in the midst of that, he prays, Father, if you're willing, uh, would you remove this cup from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And we can learn from Abraham and, and Moses and Jacob and Samuel and Elijah and all these other guys that, that pray some pretty fantastic prayers that we would never even know to even have the language for. And yet Jesus here, at the pinnacle of his turmoil and pressure, he says, your will be done, not mine. And I think that's something we can all grab onto, is to learn from the example of Jesus. Some of you might need to just pray this verbatim, word for word. Like your prayer this week is going to be in the midst of everything you face and everything you don't know you're going to go through yet. And everything, every prayer you're going to see answered and every prayer you're not going to see answered. In the midst of all of that this week, your prayer is going to be, Father, your will be done, not mine. Maybe you never had the language for that. Maybe you never knew that was something that you could, you could and should be praying is this daily prayer of surrender and letting go and trusting the will of the Father and and knowing you know better than I do. I will not be wise in my own eyes. I'm acknowledging you. Father, your will be done. And for some of you, that's, that's all you need is just to bring this before the Father daily and say, your will be done, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. So we can learn from examples of people in, in, in Scripture There are people, and there are going to be times where you might see what appears to be a bad example of prayer, and you're like, that doesn't seem right. Or the way the narrative is flowing and where that 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 prayer takes that person that doesn't that didn't seem like the right thing to pray or the right way to pray and you can learn from bad examples you can learn from good examples so all throughout scripture when you read the bible be this is just like a hermeneutic principle when you learn to when you are interpreting and concluding and making application and trying to understand the text learn how to draw wisdom from not just good examples but also those who are bad examples of things in scripture. So that's number one. When we say pray the scriptures, your understanding of of the story of the Bible and characters in the Bible and situations that took place, all of that is informing what you think about prayer. All of that is informing about what you think about how to approach God and what you should be saying. All of that data should be coming together to give you this mosaic of how I ought to pray and how I ought to approach God. The second thing though is we can learn from clear statements in Scripture. So there are some, well, there are examples set in Scripture of how to pray and and what we can be doing and all these different prayers we can be praying. There's also clear instructions just about how to approach God, whether that be in worship or prayer. Um, You know, for instance, in James chapter 4, it talks about humility versus pride. You know, God gives more grace. Therefore, it says God actually opposes the proud. Okay, so that's something I should consider Uh, When I approach God, am I approaching him with a sense of pride and entitlement and self-righteousness and ego? Um, Because God actually gives grace to the humble in contrast with the proud. So therefore, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And though this is a life application like way of living verse, um, there's something about it that definitely applies to the way we approach God too. Not just the way I live in a general sense, but in the way that I approach God specifically through prayer. Am I approaching in humility with an admission um, that I can be confident and I can be you know, bold to approach the throne of God, but at the same time, I understand that He graciously allows for me to be here and that keeps me humble. Right, not in the self-condemning, beat yourself down kind of way, but in a humility, you're so great, and I see myself in light of you, and in in you know, in light of your greatness, I see how small I am. There's a humility that should be um, in our hearts as we approach God. Also, this submission to the will of God, like Jesus, uh, in Luke chapter 22. There's some other scriptures we could talk about when it comes to praying. First uh, Thessalonians 5:16, rejoice always and pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Jesus Christ for you. So when I think about praying, there should be a sense in which, I don't know, um, part of our my my human tendency is to say I've prayed enough for today and kind of close up the bottle of prayer, seal it up, put it on the shelf, and not engage with God anymore. But when you understand that there is a 
moment to moment invitation from God for you to come and be with him. When you understand that throughout your day, all day, God is inviting you to be present with him. God is inviting you to be aware of his presence. God is inviting you to participate in what he's doing in the world on a moment to moment basis. You realize that I don't have to close up the bottle of prayer once I've prayed enough. I can actually engage and interact with God all as much as I can because it's an open heaven. God is inviting me to have as much of him as I'd like, to be as close to him as I'd like. And it's up to me how much I'm going to actually pursue him in prayer throughout my day. When I'm driving, when I'm picking up the kids, when I'm going to the store, when I'm taking a shower, when I'm doing the dishes, fill in the blank with every monotonous activity and everything else you do throughout the day. All of that can be done not just in dedication to God, not just for His glory, but with Him in a partnership way where you're thinking about Him and you're talking to Him and you're engaging with Him throughout your life. And that's the invitation to walk with God, is pray without ceasing. It's not this oppressive rule where it's like, you're not praying enough all the time, more, more, more. It's, hey, there's more for us. Pray without ceasing. Um, But also it's this consistent, don't give up until you get an answer kind of prayer. Keep knocking. Know your father's good. Know he gives good things to those who ask. Know that if you knock enough, he's going to open the door. Whether it's a yes or a no or a not yet, keep knocking. Pray with without ceasing. Not just in a uh, periodical sense throughout your day. Pray as much as you can, but in a persistence kind of way. Like the persistent widow parable. Who is coming to the judge day after day going, give me my justice. And Jesus goes, when the Son of Man comes back, will he, will he see that kind of faith? Matthew chapter 6, when you, go, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret, he will reward you. So this is the invitation is to not just pray publicly and congregationally and with other believers in public, but also, hey, do this, pray in secret. Pray privately, pray in your closet, pray in a way where it's just, it's just about you and the Father. And if it ever becomes about public, a public uh, spectacle, if it ever becomes about people approving and applauding and, and going, whoa, look at those prayers, look at those big words. I didn't even know that theology until he's taught it to me through his prayer. It's fantastic. If that's all your prayers are about, uh, there's more for you. I'll say that. I'm not going to be condemning. I'm just saying there's more for you. And you're not necessarily using prayer the way it's supposed to be used, which is to just be near God and bring your request to him and draw near Uh, through Jesus and faith in him. You know, we can go to John chapter 16. Um, Jesus says this in verse 23 and 24, which is interesting. He says, In that day you'll ask nothing of me. Truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. So this is interesting. There, there is some instruction within this, not just, not in a legalistic kind of way where it's like, pray like this or you're not praying right. But here it's like, hey, come and ask so you can receive and then your joy will be full. But here's the requirement, okay? Here's the necessity. Here's something you can't just push to the side. True, genuine, biblical prayer is always done in the name of Jesus. It's through him. It's by him. It's for him. Just as all creation exists through him, by him, and for him. That's the idea, is that we're approaching the Father through the death and resurrection and atoning work of Jesus. And we have confidence because of him. And we're praying in direction, in his direction, for his glory, for his kingdom, for his name, and for his gospel. So all those different elements. And I know that some people get overwhelmed with all the data. And, and, And some people, they're just thinking about, I got to think about all of this when I talk to God. It seems so complicated. When you just break this apart piece by piece and you just just spend a week focusing on one thing. This week, I'm going to learn how to pray in his name. And then the next week, I'm going to add on this dimension of I'm going to try and pray during my drive. And I'm going to pray in his name on my drive. And you just begin throughout your life as you walk with Jesus, you begin to um, develop a sturdier a more solid prayer life. And you start to accumulate things and add to what you've already begun to do well, right? So I don't want people be, being overwhelmed with all the data and being like, I can't do all this. You're not supposed to all at once. This is just God inviting you, giving you a glimpse of what's possible, what you should be doing, what you can be doing, and start off one step at a time. Implement one of these things today. Take one of these scriptures 
and begin praying them over your life and over the life of your family and those who you love. And here's the last thing, okay? Here are the 11 scriptures that have just, um, if there's anything that has dramatically improved and benefited my prayer life, if there's anything that has taken my prayer life to the level that it is today um, and given me the language and the heart to pray what I do, it's these 11 scriptures. And when I say <clears throat> pray the scriptures, quote the scriptures in your prayer time, some people, again, are going to go into religious mode where they turn off their mind, turn off their thinking, and they just begin spouting off verses, you know, word for word that they've memorized in Awana or Sunday school when they're six. And now it's just about getting the right things out there. Hopefully they land and it's like you're just trying to throw a bunch of stuff, hoping it hits a target, and you're not even thinking about what you're saying. So we've already established in previous sessions, when we pray, it's not mindless. Um, it's not without my conscious effort. It's not this, I've rehearsed a verse, now I'm going to memorize it and just regurgitate it to God, and it's going to yield the right result. The, the scriptures are not a book of incantations. I know some people, we've been trained by culture, watching certain movies or watching certain shows or just being around the culture that we are, we've been trained to think that the way that we get results in our life with God is to just say the right thing. It's like this magical spell we're casting. Take away that way of thinking right now. That's not at all what we're doing. This is not mindless memorization. This is not mindless repetition. This is not... Uh, just me rehearsing things over and over to hopefully get God to move. And if I just keep saying it hard enough and loud enough, and, and if I say it long enough, that's not how this works. This is just what God has revealed about himself in his word should inform not just how I live and how I see things, but how I pray in response to what I'm going through. So let me show you a few examples, okay? Before I jump into the 11 scriptures that I personally um, love, 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 love praying. Here's a few examples of people in the Bible praying scripture, okay? You have Jesus on the cross um, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's directly quoting Psalm 22, okay? Or if you go to Acts chapter 4, you have the apostles responding to the persecution around them, and they lift up their voices. Here's what they pray. They pray Psalm chapter 2. Um, Jesus prays Psalm 22. They pray Psalm 2. And they, they say this to God, Sovereign Lord who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You, through the mouth of our father David, you said by the Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? So if you go here, this right here is Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. So the way that they're seeing their situations, the way that they're responding, and the way that they're praying is in, uh, informed by Psalm chapter 2. The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Truly in this city, they were gathered together against Jesus, uh, whom you appointed and anointed, Herod and Pontius Pilate and, and the Gentiles and the people of Israel. And they'll go on and on. So the way that Peter and, and the gang see their situation is, in, is through the lens of Psalm chapter 2. So the way that they're going to respond is also going to be informed by that same scripture that informs how they see their situation. Uh, Psalm 86, the psalmist going, hey, in fact, let me give you a few verses. I think this is really cool. I just want you to see this. Every New Testament prayer, when you go to the New Testament, every New Testament prayer somehow finds its uh, basis in the Old Testament. Somehow what people are praying in the New Testament is rooted in the Old so you can find some kind of Old Testament passage in Scripture to link to whatever it is that's being prayed in the New Testament. So there's always this eye towards the Old Testament as prayers are being uttered. And Psalm chapter 119, I encourage you to just read the whole chapter. It's going to take you like three months, but read it. Because in this chapter, we have David going off. He's going ham just on the word of God. He's going, blessed are those whose way is blameless. And I've highlighted in blue any direct prayers to God, right? So there are times where David is just talking to God about things. Then there are things that David is requesting. Okay, so, and this is where we glean, you know, from the wisdom of scripture, we go, okay, so there is such a thing as talking to God about things, and I don't always have to be requesting something. Yes, exactly. 
then for some of you, that might be a revelation. You're like, you mean when I talk to God, I don't just have to request every second and just ask for things and beg for things and petition? I can just have a conversation? Absolutely. In fact, David just talks to God about his law. And, and, and standing back in our culture with that difference in our culture, we go, why is David doing that? God already knows these things about his law. David, hello, you don't need to tell God. He already knows, buddy. It's cute, but he already got that down. And David's going, I'm not informing him. I'm just talking to him. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. So you've commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Notice, there's no smooth transition from when David is, is just talking generally and when he's talking directly to God in a request. There's no neat and smooth transition. It's just kind of up and down, up and down. And, and this is how we talk to people. In the middle of our conversation, just talking about the weather, or just inserting requests or, you know, hey, would you be able to, there's no like transition. Hey, I'm about to make a request, Nancy or, or John. I'm about to ask you for something. It's just conversation. And I think we should learn. I'm, I'm not saying uh, to approach God the exact same way you have conversation with people. He is different. He is holy. He is otherly. But there is this friendship dimension that I believe many people don't know they can have. There is a discussion conversation, uh, relationship that you can have with God where you just talk about his things. They don't have to be things that like, I can only talk about his word or I can only talk about, you can talk about anything. Um, and some people have a problem with that because they think that God only has time for the serious things. God only has time, uh, only has time to spend on things that are worth his energy. And it's like, he doesn't want to talk about your career. He doesn't want to know about what you're going through with your family. He didn't care about whether or not you want to buy a playground for your kids. It doesn't matter to him. And yet, when I read scripture, when I see the character of God revealed through the narrative, I, I see otherwise. I see a God who deeply cares about the details. I see a God who actually, his word is a great indication that he's all about the details. Not just about his plan to redeem all things, but the details of your life. David will go on, oh, that my ways may be steadfast it's a prayer request in keeping your statutes. Then I won't be put to shame having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. Now look at the, the transition from what I will do and what I want to do to God do this. Do not utterly forsake me. And you see this pattern throughout the rest of Psalm 119. It's this breaking in and out of just conversation to praising God, to thanking God, to asking God to just talking about his law, to just delighting in his law, and David's telling him things he already knows. That this is, this is where I think, um, I want to be careful how I say this. Um, but when you mature in Christ, when you really grow in him, with him, you mature to a place where you're more confident and comfortable in your relationship with him. It took a long time to say, with more words than I should have, we grow in our comfort with God. We become more uh, accustomed to His ways. We become, we become more, not in a negative way, we become more familiar with His heart so that our prayers are less, ah, don't kill me, and, and, and they're more like, hey God, like I love you. And I love that you're in my life. And I love that I get to be in traffic and have a car to drive. And, and I'm thankful not about the traffic itself, but I'm thankful that you have allowed my car to not explode on me. Like You just invite God into those small moments that you'd otherwise throughout your life kept him out of because he's, he's too big for this. He doesn't care about these things. And yet, Scripture seems to want to lead us into a prayer life where we understand that God deeply cares about a lot of things that you would be surprised of. Um, about. You know, so we can go to Psalm, I encourage you to read Psalm 119. David just goes in and out of that um, conversation, request, thank, praise. It's, it's beautiful. It's just a, a glimpse into the kind of relationship that David had as a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> Psalm 8611, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. So here's, here's an actual scripture you can pray. 
Like you can pray this verbatim. Now, when I say pray this verbatim, I don't mean turn your brain on autopilot and just say the thing and then go back to life. I mean, actually mean what you're saying. Understand what you're saying. Think through the words that are coming out of your mouth. Teach me your way, O Lord. Let's just break this down in the English. Teach me your way. There are ways that I don't inherently know about. I need to be instructed in those things. And I'm asking the only one who can really, really lead me into those ways, that being God, to teach me those ways that are foreign to me. I want to walk in your truth. So it's not just teach me your way for the sake of that. It's so that the effect in my life would be that my life reflects your truth and my, the way that I walk is governed by your truth. And unite my heart. My heart needs to be united to something. To fear your name. Okay, so, so there's all these different elements, right? There's unite my heart in order to fear your name. And I can break this apart. So you can pray this. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. This is 20 words. You can pray 20 words today. You can pray 20 words tomorrow. If you just begin to, um, and it's right here, teach me your way for those that are asking, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. When you, I'll tell you what, the more you under, the more you seek God in his word, the more that the spirit of God will drive his word into your heart. Your heart will become full of his word just by natural, organic result of, of seeking God in his word is God plants that in your heart. It takes root, it develops, it grows so that over time, after 10 years of studying scripture, after 10 years of walking with God and knowing him and his word, you have all these beautiful passages that you've memorized just by reading his word. You've memorized these things or they come to mind when you pray so that now you have all these different beautiful scriptures to pull from when you pray. And then Psalm, Psalm 86, 11 comes to mind. And you go, that's right, Lord. I need to be instructed in your way. I need to walk in your truth. I need you to unite my heart to fear your name on a daily basis. So, Lord, would you do that? Would you do that? So, there's all these examples of here's how you pray the scriptures. You can pray it verbatim. You can learn from examples. You can take prayers from Paul and Jesus and David and just kind of combine them into your own special 2024 prayer for the year. You can do that as long as the word of God is somehow informing not just what you say and how you say it, but even how you're thinking about what you're saying. So here's 11 scriptures that I love to pray. Okay, we're going to go through this line by line. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 7. It says, the grass withers. The flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Now, and by the way, Chauncey, I'm using the ESV, English Standard Version, for those that are wondering. This right here. You might be thinking, this is the bulk of what I'm focusing on. When I say, let's pray Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, you're thinking, ah, the word of our God will stand forever. Well, hold on. You can't necessarily pray that without understanding what it stands in stark contrast to, which is that people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. The grass withers, the flower fades. Everything in green is what the Lord blows on, and they whew, just get swept away. But what doesn't get swept away, what doesn't cease is the word of our God. So when I pray that, this is why this scripture in particular, really, I just love reminding myself, it, God, it's your word that stands forever. Like I just want to have an accurate view of the world around me and my life situations and my problems and my pain and even the people in my life. I want to see things the way you do. And everything here is temporary. Everything here in a hundred years, people probably won't even know who I am. People won't know who my family is. Our names will not continue. But when we're resurrected in the new kingdom, or in, in the kingdom, in new creation, in the new earth, that's where things really get fun. What, what, and not to say that everything about this world doesn't matter, it's, it's useless, it's purposeless, just kind of do whatever you want and don't follow God. I'm saying 
what is of this world comes to an end. <sighs> Blows away. The word of God does not. Because it's otherworldly. It's different. So what's beautiful about that is when, when that informs our prayer, I get an accurate perspective of the world around me in contrast with the word of God, which doesn't cease and doesn't end. Now here's another scripture I love praying. Easily one of my favorites. <clears throat> if it shows up. Right here. This is when um, Moses is going to Pharaoh and he's saying, hey, tomorrow, um, uh, what plague is this? Uh, frogs. Moses is coming and saying, hey, I'll take away the frogs. And God's going to do that tomorrow, Pharaoh, um, so that you may know there's no one like the Lord our God. So when you go, how does this inform your prayers? I pray this directly. I, I honestly like will find myself 20 different times throughout my prayer. not Sometimes on autopilot, sometimes not. Just saying, God, there is, there's no one like you. There's no one like you. And the more I say that, the more it resonates, the more it, 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 it uh, takes deeper root in my heart, the more it affects my understanding of the world and, and affects the way that I live. So I just want to rehearse that as much as I can. There's no one like you. There's no one like you, Lord. That you, are, you literally stand alone in a class all on your own as the holy, distinct creator of all things, the one who is outside time, space, and matter, who precedes all of it. You precede all of this. There's no one like you. And, and maybe I don't need to pray that word for word. Maybe just for you in your prayer time, it's helpful to remember Exodus 8.10 tells me that there's no one like the Lord my God. So as I approach him, I'm not approaching him as common. I'm not approaching him as just another friend. I'm not approaching him as just the guy who gives me what I want when I'm good enough. I'm approaching him as the holy, sanctified, set apart, distinctly different God of all things. The God of creation is the one that I'm approaching and it's beneficial to me and it's helpful to remember who he is. Real quick, if you don't know me, my name is Jason, and I have some free gifts for you at AboveReproachMinistry.com. Go to the website or click the links in the description below to check out all of our free Bible study resources. We have online Bible classes, devotional studies, Bible study workshops, all of my sermon notes, and more. You can even join our online church community on the Discord app. We also have discussion groups all around the world, and if you don't see one in your area, message me, and we'll help you start a launch group. I personally lead a group in Spartanburg, South Carolina. If you live in the area, we'd love to have you you join us on Fridays for Bible study. So contact me if you're interested and if you or your church would like me to come preach or teach, just message me or shoot me an email and we'll see what we can do because I love preaching in person. If you're a new follower of Jesus, click the new believer section to access everything we recommend for new believers. And be sure to snag a copy of my book Fruitful to support this ministry. All right, that's all I got for you. Let's jump back into the video. Exodus 15 11, which is a very similar statement to the last verse. <clears throat> Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Which, is, again, is, has this ring to it that there's no one like you. The answer, no one. No one is like the Lord among the gods. Who is like you? I'm just going to highlight this because it repeats twice. <laughs> Majestic in holiness. Awesome in glorious deeds. Doing wonders. Yeah, who's like you? And I just want to recall this in prayer. I want this to inform the way that I approach God. I want this to inform the way that I think about God. And go, you are the one who is, there's no one comparable to you. There's reflections, there's image, there's shadows, there's, there's these, these glimpses of you in creation and in the world. But you, as the only true and divine creator of all things, who exists yesterday, today, and forevermore, is eternally ex existent and the same. You never change. You're majestic in holiness. You do wonders. You're awesome in glorious deeds. There is no one like you. And, and, and sometimes that will lead you into just a time of praise and worship. This, this moves you into a time of praise where your heart is just full of thankfulness and gratitude and worship towards God. Exodus 15, 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 is another one. God shows his love for us. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And you go, what, how does that affect our prayers? Because my goodness, it is so, I, want, I wanted to say the word fun. I don't think that's the appropriate word. It is so enjoyable to look back at what God pulled me out of 
and look at what he's done for me now and look at who I am today and look at all the kindness he showed me in light of who I used to be and to go, God, all, look at that gap. While we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, you showed your love for us and Jesus died. How does God show his love How does God show his love? Jesus is sent. Jesus willingly lays down his life. And who is it that Jesus is laying down his life for? Who is it that God is loving? Sinners. People who were dead in sin and wanted nothing to do with God. Jesus lays, that that should inform, that should lead you to worship. Just in your prayer time, I honestly will sometimes just go, God, you're the God who shows love to people and you lay down your life and you do the, the, the most possible for people who are sinners and still dead in sin that can't do anything for themselves. And sometimes that'll lead me on a tangent to just think about how good and kind and gracious and merciful and, and I'll just start meditating on the gospel and voicing my love for God. Sometimes that's where it leads you. But just to allow that to influence how you pray, you're the God who shows love in the midst of all the darkness and evil and, un, and undeservedness on our part. You're the God who shows love nonetheless. And wow, wow, will that move you? Um, I don't know, just to, just to see him rightly, just to see him rightly. Psalm chapter two, verse two. Interestingly enough, we saw that next. Um, I love this. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He, he who sits in the heavens laughs. And the Lord holds them in derision. And you go, That's why does that influence your prayer time? Because my God is over all nations. Because our God is over all enemies. Spiritual enemies, anyone who would choose to be on the side of darkness, spiritual beings that are in opposition to God, any enemies, any threat, any being that is against us, in opposition to us, that even wants to um, break God's... I don't want to be under God. I want to break out from him. God's going, all your planning and scheming. Like when we when we look at the world around us, here's a very practical reason I pray this. When we look at the world around us, falling apart, and we go, I don't even know if we're going to be a nation tomorrow. I'll be very honest. For those of us that live in the U.S., I don't even know if we're going to survive another week. I don't know what's going to happen this election. Things just seem to be going downhill. It's just downhill. It's nothing else. There's no whoop. It's just downhill. Governmentally, politically, it's just garbage, right? So we're looking at that going, that sucks. What do we do? Remember this. All the plotting, all the raging, all the disobedience, all the opposition. When men come together and try to take down God and his people and, 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 and break apart his kingdom and stop God's plan from being accomplished, God just looks down. And he laughs in derision. Not to at all make light of the fact that there's real death and destruction, but to say that our God is so above it all. It's kind of like what Paul says. The, the suffering of this life is not even worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. It's that idea. It's, I forgot. We, we can get so caught up in the news and, and the TikToks we're seeing and the, ooh, did you see this happen? Did you see what they said? Did you see what they're doing? Did you see the, the laws there? And so, who freaking cares? Do, do, do you know who my God is? Psalm chapter 2. He's the God who sits above it all. And sometimes I just need to remind myself of that. Like, I know that. I heard that in Sunday school. Heard that yesterday. Heard that in a message this morning. Heard, I'm hearing it everywhere. But do you live like it? Are you praying like it? That's the question. Are you actually approaching God in a way where you understand, yep, you're sovereign, you're in charge, you're in control. Everything is working according to your good, for our good and according to your plan. It's all coming together, even if it looks like absolute hell on the earth and, and people are conspiring. We're like, I don't know, if they form an army and they form an alliance and they come together, it's all hell breaking loose and you got world. God is over it all. And I just think when it's all said and done, and you pray in the midst of all that, this is what you need to remember. That he knows. He sees it all. He ain't forgotten. He's looking. He's in the midst of it all. He's not distant, going, I can't wait to send my, my workers to go and handle this. God is present in the midst of all of it. And no one can stop. This is the beautiful truth about what we pray. No one can stop what God sets into motion. No one can. 
Exodus 34, 5, I love, love praying for this, uh, or praying this, rather. Um, the Lord passed by Moses, and he proclaims, the Lord, the Lord, uh, this is how the, the Lord reveals himself. I am a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but I will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. But notice how the third and fourth generation are far outweighed by the steadfast love God shows to thousands of generations. Right? So, you go, how does this affect the way that you pray? Why does it affect you? Because when I pray, I honestly just love, before I even, sometimes I don't do this, but... I try my best before I even begin to voice my concerns and pleas and requests. And here's God, what's going on? I go, Lord, you you're merci- You revealed yourself to Moses as a God who is merciful. You say you're gracious, and I've seen it. You're slow to anger, which is wonderful. You're quick to forgive. You're abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You keep steadfast love for thousands of generations. That's who you are. And before I voice any of my requests, before I start going off the rails, before I even get mad, I just want to remember who it is that I'm talking to and what it even means that you are these things, that you're merciful, that you're gracious, that you're slow to... I want to recall your character. If this is who God reveals himself to be to Moses, then I want this to inform the way that I approach him. This is who you are. This is who I'm coming to meet. This is who's going to answer my prayer request with a yes, a no, or a not yet. This is the God who's working all things together for good, even if it means saying no to what I'm asking for. This is the Father that I'm approaching. Romans 8.28 is another good one. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. And, And sometimes it is just saying that verbatim to God. You are a God who works all things together for my good. And I know that. I believe that. I trust that. Right now, I'm kind of having a hard time seeing that and making sense of how that's possible with the hell that's breaking out in my life. It's really hard to see this God, but I know it's true that you are a God who works all things together for good for those who are called according to your purpose. And sometimes I don't just say it. I, like I just I meditate on it. And as I'm praying, I, I, I recognize that I'm kind of praying with an anxious, troubled heart. And it's because I've forgotten that In the midst of all this, he is working all things together for my, our good, collectively. And when I remind myself of that, the anxiety, the frustration, the the, the bitterness setting in seems to start to dissipate because the word of God is taking up residency in place of those things. Psalm 63, verse 3, I love this one. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. I mean, I'll find myself saying this like 10 times in whenever I pray. Whenever I just dedicate a time to just sit before the Lord and I can focus, my kids aren't screaming in the background, there's no one to rescue from death, I can just sit here and be present. They're gone at the mall or whatever they're doing. Ah, God, your steadfast love is better than life. I don't even know what that means. I'll say that, Lord, I don't, I don't even know what that means. I have an, I have a, a, like, I can imagine what it means. I have a basic, like, concept of what that means, but your steadfast love for me is better than life. I just thank you for that. I praise you for that. I honor you for that. I just, I want to become more aware of that. And that will just begin to sit on my heart for a little while and really move me um, to just meditate more on the gospel and the love that God has shown us through his son. Is your steadfast love is better than life. If I'm not living like that, change my life so I begin to live like that. I want to live like your love is better than life. That is such, that for, for some of you, that's all you need. For some of you, all you needed today um, was just to come here and know that you can actually meditate on that scripture throughout your day in your life. Your steadfast love is better than life. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, he's the radiance, and we could probably turn every not every passage, a lot of scriptures into prayers and inform our prayers with those. But I've chosen these for a reason. These are what um, are very special to me. Hebrews 1.3, he's the radiance of the glory of God, Jesus. He's the exact imprint of his nature. 
He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. I just want to remember who Jesus is. Who it is that I'm approaching the Father through. Who it is that's mediating the new covenant for all of us. Who it is that stands there as our great high priest to represent us before the Father. Who it is that welcomes and invites us to come to his throne. It's the one who's the radiance of the glory of God. It's the one who's the exact imprint of his nature. And I'll just pray that. I'll go, you literally up. This is my favorite thing to pray in this verse. You uphold the universe by the word of your power. That is unbelievable. It just puts things into perspective for us. It puts our problems into perspective. It puts our frustrations into perspective. It puts our temptations and sins and addictions and struggles and heartaches and, and everything that we face puts it all into perspective so that we see all those things in light of the God who is so powerful. He upholds the very universe by the word of his power. Uh, Colossians 3, 1 and 2 If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So what I typically, what this leads me to pray, which I haven't actually prayed in a while, is God, would you please like raise my affections? Um, Help me to seek the things that are above where you are. Set my mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. You can pray this. You can make this into a prayer. Thank you, Janet. You can pray this. In for that gift, as you can pray this as something that um, you understand that you need. I, Lord, ooh, my mind gets so tethered to this world. I get so distracted. I get so uh, fuzzy in my brain and my thinking and my mind. I, I get so unaware of your promises. God, set my mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth, please. I don't want to have an earthly, worldly mind that's just stuck to this temporary life. Raise my affections, raise my, my, my thinking, raise my focus, focus me back on Jesus. It's a wonderful prayer to pray. And this is the last one, John 16, 33. I, if anything, if I don't like say this in prayer, um, I will definitely be thinking of this at some point. Jesus says in the upper room to his 11 boys, because Judas is a punk, I've said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. See, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Which, uh, if you notice, a lot of these scriptures have much to do with God being over it all, God being sovereign, God being in control, God working things for good, God nothing escaping his, his power and sight and control. Everything comes together in the grand plan of redemption. If you notice, there's a theme within all of my favorite scriptures. Because you know what? For me, my tendency is to forget that he's in control and to assume more control than I have. As if to say that I'm in control of these things that I'm really not in control of. Um, And we get anxious and fearful and distracted. And we just kind of isolate. We get so downcast and so despairing that we just shut down, give up, sit in the corner and suck our thumb until something changes. And this verse calls us out of that. Where Jesus goes, now actually, I've overcome the world. So you can have peace, my peace, in the middle of tribulation, in the middle of the world. Everything you face and go through, and I just need that when I pray. I need my anxious, troubled heart to settle down. Like the way that I tell my kids, whoa, hey, settle down. Take three deep breaths. I don't want to take three deep breaths. It never works, Dad. It's stupid. Take three deep breaths. I said deep, and let's let's make them calm this time. It didn't work. Do you feel a little better? Yes. That's exactly what prayer is to me. And when Scripture informs our prayers and reminds us of who he is uh, we can have more precise calm um, well thought out prayers not to say that uh, God is waiting for you to like voice or, or say the right words 
But it's about, are you even thinking rightly as you're saying these things? Sometimes a lot of the things we pray come from a heart of anxiety and fear and and depression and self-hatred. And and you can be honest and raw and vulnerable and transparent with God for sure. Voice those things, but don't stay in that place. There's something about John 16, 33 that reels me back in. Like God just like, oh, we got a big one. He's, He's fighting today. He's reeling me back in. And I remember I do have reason for peace. You have overcome the world. So I'm going to pray like it. And since you've overcome the world, there are some things I was going to pray that I'm actually not even thinking I need to pray anymore because it was coming from a heart of fear as if you weren't in control, as if I don't have peace, as if you haven't overcome the world, but you have. So maybe you can pray this, God, you've overcome the world. You've literally overcome the enemy and all darkness and all evil and all sin and death And you've granted me not just peace, but the actual reason for peace. You've given me peace with yourself. I have peace with God. My heart can can have the actual comfort and and reassurance of God that comes from knowing I have peace with Him. Like you just need to remind yourself of that. So hopefully these 11 scriptures, um, one of them resonated with you. One of them, again, some of these you'll pray word for word. Others, you'll just kind of take parts of these these scriptures and then pray them. Others, you know, they're, you're not going to pray them at all. They're just going to inform how you pray. You're just going to be praying like he's in control. You're just going to be praying like he holds all things together. You're just going to be praying, you know, like he loves the world so much that while we were still sinners, he died for us. You're going to be praying like that. And there's something about the character of God that absolutely, absolutely should inform the way that we pray. What we pray, how we pray, how we approach God. And I know this was a pretty elementary and basic message, but some of you, some of you, um, have never thought through even one of these things before. Um, And I don't want to overload you. I just want just one of these things to resonate with you um, and to help you. All right. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to share your thoughts and your insights in the comments. And thank you for supporting this ministry. Your support helps us accomplish our mission, which is to teach people how to read the Bible so they can live and teach it for themselves. We're only able to make all of these free resources because of generous supporters like you. So thank you very much for all of your support. Make sure to visit AboveReproachMinistry.com to check out all of our free resources. And as always, keep moving towards Jesus.